right, well, we're continuing this series on grace, we're calling it Grace Poured Out. I'm excited about this series. I've enjoyed uh, each of these lessons. Uh, it's been a blessing to me. It's been an encouragement to me. It's been a help to me. I hope it has to you as well. And this morning, we're going to look at uh, replenishing grace, replenishing grace. We've talked about renewing grace and restoring grace, and today it's replenishing grace. We'll be in the book of 2 Timothy. Uh, but we know fighting the battle, you know, what we'll see this morning as Paul writes that uh, we're in a spiritual battle. We're in warfare as believers. And uh, fighting the spiritual battle in our own strength, well, it's impossible. We, we're not going to accomplish anything doing it in our own strength. And uh, if we're going to grow our spiritual muscles, we got to go through some training. Uh, as a soldier, you know, you've got some training that you have to go through uh, there in the beginning. We've got to grow those spiritual muscles. We've got to develop our spiritual muscles just like we do physical muscles. And uh, what does it take to develop muscles? Well, it requires some effort. It requires some struggles, right? Uh, it's not easy to do those things. Uh, if it was easy, everybody would have, you know, big muscles and a six-pack like, uh, like your preacher. Like Alan. I see Alan's online this morning. Uh, but you don't become a strong soldier for Christ without going through some training. And so uh, his training program uh, includes this grace that we're going to look at this morning that will help us in preparing to win the victory. So let's look at the first three verses of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, this is Paul's final letter, the final words that he penned to us uh, before he left this earth. And he begins by telling Timothy... Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's our key word, grace. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so this morning we want to understand how grace will replenish our strength uh, for the battle and, and come this morning to the point where we can appreciate when we have uh, suffering and struggles in our lives. Sometimes we despise those things. But when we appreciate the suffering and the struggles and the tough times, when we embrace that God uh, has a purpose for those, we'll mature spiritually. That's what God wants. He wants us to mature spiritually, right? Well, we said a few weeks ago when we started this series that, uh, that each week this was going to be kind of like refueling our grace tank, that sometimes it can get kind of low. Uh, how many of you would say, you know, I have, I have had in the past, I have had, quote, one of those days? How many of you have ever had one of those days? How many of you ever have, uh, you know, kind of uh, just thought, you know, uh, those days have lasted for weeks at a time? I've had those weeks. Yeah. They've just, they've been extended periods. It's like just one of those days runs into the next and the next and the next. And uh, life in our world today can just be very hectic. And uh, it's like the, it's like the little boy. Uh, he saw a commercial for a, a particular brand of detergent. And so he went down to the store and, and uh, picked, a, picked a jug of it up and took it to the counter. And, and the, uh, the man at the counter said, uh, why are you buying this? He said, well, I've got a cat at home, and I'm going to give it a bath. And the, uh, the man at the counter said, this detergent is really too strong to use on your cat. Uh, you'd probably kill your cat if you try this. Uh, he went ahead and bought it, and a few days later, the little boy was back at the store, and, and the, uh, the grocer asked him, he said, how's your cat doing? And the boy said, well, he's dead. And he said, see, I told you that that was too strong for him. He said, oh, that's, he said, it, it wasn't the soap, mister. It was the spin cycle that got him. <laughs> uh, you ever felt like you've been caught in a spin cycle in life, you know, that you're just kind of tumbling over and over? Uh, I was reminded of just a couple days ago, uh, you have to ask my mom to tell you the story, but uh, she once uh, did that to a cat, stuck it in, you know, the dryer and dried it, and uh, she, she gets a real kick out of it. If you're a cat lover, you probably don't want to hear the story, but uh, she'll make the face and everything that the cat had on it when it came out of the dryer. It, it was an accident, snuck into the uh, dryer somehow, but she's, she's actually stuck a cat on the spin cycle. 
Uh, so, you know, sometimes in life we can be stuck in a spin cycle. That's why we need God's grace. And his grace is, is more than sufficient for the needs that we have. And uh, we need grace to replenish us. I mean, we're living in a fallen world. Ever since uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, this world has just continued to, to go downhill, right? We see pain, suffering, struggles, death. Uh, and so that's why we need God's grace to replenish us. And we know from scriptures we see this morning that uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual warfare that we're in. We're in a battle, and that's uh, one of the functions of the church, in addition to just acting as a place of, of worship and a place of, of service and fellowship, uh, it's supposed to be a place where we can grow in the grace of the Lord. Uh, the, the church should be sort of like an island of hope. When everything else in the world kind of go in the opposite direction, this is kind of a, a haven this morning that we can come to and gather with others uh, going through the same type of trials, and we can be encouraged, and we can, we can get that grace tank refilled. So this morning, number one, I want you to see that his grace will replenish our strength. His grace replenishes our strength. You've probably noticed this too, but it seems like when people in their lives become very busy and consumed with work, school, other things going on in life, that it always seems like it's the, the things that they do serving God that get pushed out first. I'm just too busy. I, I don't have time to come to church anymore. I don't have time to teach Sunday school anymore. I don't have time to, to do the bus anymore. Uh, I'm just too busy. We make time for all the other stuff in our lives, but when it comes to serving God, sometimes that gets pushed out. And it's unfortunate as believers, we kind of see that as optional. Like serving God is just something we just kind of pick and choose. We do it when it's convenient. When it's not convenient, we push that out and we embrace all the other things in life. Well, God's design for our lives is to embrace his work. And that's why Paul's writing here in this last letter as he's approaching the end of his life. He, you know, he calls Timothy his son in the faith. And he, he's saying, you know, Timothy, I'm not going to be here any longer. I'm getting ready to go. I've been your mentor for a while. Uh, but you're going to face the battle now without me. Uh, you're going to have to face the, the discouraging days. You're going to have to face the opposition, the, the struggles. All these things are going to... Uh, come and, and I'm not going to be here any longer. Uh, and in fact, history tells us that Timothy himself uh, was martyred while pastoring the church and, and so uh, at Ephesus. And so Paul's telling Timothy, because of all these things that's going to go on and because I'm not going to be here any longer, he said, Timothy, it's, it's important that you grow strong in the grace of the Lord because you're going to need that grace for the coming days. There's going to be some things that you're going to encounter, uh, and, and you may not find somebody else around you that, that can just immediately lift you up and give you the words. So you've got to grow in the grace of the Lord. So number one, grace replenishes strength. He tells Timothy, it'll replenish your strength for service. And this is the same for us. God's grace, he'll pour it out in your life, and he'll replenish it for you to be able to serve him because that's God's desire, that's God's purpose in your life is that you serve him. And he'll replenish that strength. Uh, I like what Paul wrote. Uh, I believe Paul wrote this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse number 28. He says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. He, he ties grace and serving God together. You see that there? Uh, Paul, in, his, in these words in 2 Timothy, you know, he didn't start out by, by telling uh, Timothy, you know, Timothy, be all that you can be. He didn't tell Timothy, you know, uh, uh, what, what, the, what the mind can conceive, you can achieve. It wasn't some sort of self-help message that, that Paul wrote. What did Paul say in that first verse that we read there in 2 Timothy? He says, Timothy, be strong in the grace of the Lord. Utter dependence on God's grace. Uh, because our best 
That'll never be enough. When you go through life trying to, to do your best at things and you're trying to face the battle in your own strength and your own power, that goes back to, to what we studied a, a couple of months ago about the fruit of the Spirit. When we're doing it in our own strength and we don't have the Holy Spirit's filling in our lives, uh, we're just kind of beating against the wind. And so Paul knew this firsthand. When he was struggling with his own weakness, Paul told us in 2 Corinthians, uh, he got this message from God. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. All the, the spiritual strength that we possess, it's rooted in the grace of God. You're not coming up with it on your own. I can't come up with it on my own. We will run empty. We will be like that cat in the spin cycle. I mean, we go through life trying to do it on our own. It's gonna, we're going to get beat up. And we're gonna, our grace tanks will run out. And so now he's sharing that truth with Timothy to be strong. What does that mean, to be strong? What is Paul saying? Well, according to somebody a lot smarter than me, they wrote this. To be strong means to be enabled, to have God's strength to do God's work. Now, that's what we need in life. We need God's strength to do God's work. Amen. When we get busy in life, be careful that you don't start pushing out the things of God saying I'm too busy for that because all these other temporal things are important. Now, there are some important things in life. But this is all temporary. What we have here today, this is temporary. Yeah. This is not our permanent home. We're not living here forever, folks. Uh, we're going on somewhere else. We're to, we're to be uh, setting our affection on things above. Amen. And so we need... When our grace tanks run low, we've got to be strong. We, we want to be enabled to do God's work, and so we need his strength. A man wrote to uh, the great missionary, uh, David Livingstone. He said, I'm interested in joining you. Is there an easy way to get where you are? And the story goes that Mr. Livingstone wrote back and said, uh, we're not looking for men who are looking for an easy way. We want men to join us who will make their own way if need be. Uh, how many times in life are we kind of looking for the easy way? You know, we'll serve God when it's convenient. We'll do what God wants us to do uh, if it's easy. But when tough times come, mm, I don't want to do that. That's when we need God's grace. We need his replenishing grace to, to fill us back up so we have the strength to do that. Uh, not only will we have strength for service, but he'll give us strength for suffering. In the book of James, we're told, uh, this is an encouraging verse to me. James says, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. You know, we're not the only ones who've encountered suffering. And when we compare our suffering to what these folks encountered, what we've gone through really doesn't compare, does it? I mean, they faced intense persecution. They faced intense affliction. And he says, take them as an example. I mean, that's why God gave us his word. I mean, from, from cover to cover, we have examples of other people. These were just ordinary humans, but they had the grace of God in their lives that enabled them to continue serving. You know, there's people today, there's religious groups out there, they, they will push the the narrative that, that serving God means that you'll have uh, health, wealth, and prosperity, right? But the Bible says that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus' message was kind of contrary to that. If you serve me, get ready to deal with some hard days. Uh, the late Supreme Court Justice Ant Antonin Scalia, he said... Devout Christians are destined to be regarded as fools in modern society. Well, that's ringing true, isn't it? And so grace uh, gives us strength to, to resist the outside pressures. And we all have those. Grace gives us the, the strength to keep doing what's right. We don't want to just take the easy way out. Say, I'm, I, I just can't serve God anymore. There, there's, I'm too busy. There's too many things going on. I'm encountering too much suffering. Because God's grace doesn't 
deliver us from suffering, what does God's grace do? Uh, it sustains us in our suffering. That's what he told Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. Uh, what was Paul asking? What was the context of that? Well, Paul had some physical health issues. And he went to God saying, God, would you remove these from me? I could serve you a whole lot better if I didn't have this suffering in my life. And what was the Lord's answer to Paul? I'm not taking those away. Those are going to stay there. But my grace is sufficient. Because when you're weak, that's an opportunity for your life to glorify me. When we're weak, we can glorify God. If we could do this in our own strength, we'd have the temptation to be puffed up with pride. We talk about how I've done all this. But God, he wants us to point back to him and say, I don't know how I could have got through this without God's help, without God's strength, without God's grace. I couldn't have done this on my own. Let me tell you what God has done for me. Now you have the opportunity to share your faith with somebody else. And God's grace sustains us at least through two different particular times of suffering when we're fearful, number one. And we'll all have times in our lives where we encounter some fear. Well, that's when we need God's grace. A suffering has the ability to make us fearful of the unknown. We wonder why sickness has come to our family. We may wonder why we were laid off of a job. We may wonder why our kids have drifted away, why they've been in trouble. You know, just all the suffering that you can encounter in life, it can cause you to become fearful. But what does Scripture tell us? Well, Paul wrote in this final letter to Timothy, he said in chapter 1, verse number 7, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He's telling Timothy, you've got to be strong in the grace of the Lord. Don't, don't have a spirit of fear. Someone once said, uh, worry pulls tomorrow's clouds over today's sunshine. Boy, isn't that true. I mean, we kind of talked about a few minutes ago worrying about things that never happen. And we can just take those clouds from tomorrow. Beautiful, wonderful day God's given to us. But we start worrying, man, it'll feel like, you know, Eeyore with a cloud of rain, you know, just hovering over you. I've seen some people, and I haven't lived that long, but I've seen people in my life that I wonder, you know, it's amazing how they were able to go through those circumstances. And they'll tell you that it was the grace of God, it was the strength of God, it was only by God's help that they could go through such trials. I've watched some, uh, an evangelist just uh, the past few weeks, his wife's been in ICU uh, from COVID for the last three weeks in and out of the hospital, in ICU, out of ICU. Uh, but every day, he'll post a devotional on Facebook and talk about how they're praising God for today, how God's strength is enabling to get them through, how his wife is trusting in God's plan. How do, how do people go through that? It's the grace of God. Uh, we can't do it in our own strength. And so when we're fearful, we really need that grace tank filled up. Next, when we're weary. We, we need grace when we're weary. Because we have the ability to really get worn down, don't we? The great apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.16, For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You see, you're more than just the outward man. Our society likes to put a lot of focus on the outward man. But there's more to you than just the outside. And Paul says the inward man, uh, you're a living soul. God created you for a purpose. And his grace will give you the strength to keep going no matter how tired you are. Uh, God will give you all the grace you need in every single situation. I like uh, what this author said. He said, no matter how much suffering people face, 
and how deeply they hurt because of that suffering, they need to know the truth that God's grace will be sufficient for them in all their needs. And that, that's good. That's helpful. I've got to go back to that and remind myself of that over and over uh, because when we focus on our suffering, when we focus on our suffering and our own ability to handle it, you know what? That doesn't bring us any comfort. What brings us comfort? Focusing on God and his resources in suffering. We've said that his grace, it's an unlimited supply. It's an, it's an unending resource. And when we focus on that, it'll bring us comfort. It'll bring us hope. It'll bring us encouragement. It'll sustain us. It'll, it'll renew us. It'll restore us. It'll help us get from day to day. Famous football coach Vince Lombardi, he once told his team this, fatigue makes cowards of us all. When you get worn down, when you get weary, you're going to be tempted. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? It was after 40 days of fasting. Jesus was hungry. He was physically beginning to, to get weak from this. And who shows up? The devil shows up. That's a good time to, to kind of check in, see how things are going, to test you, right? And Jesus knew that God's grace was sufficient for him. And, and if God's grace was sufficient for Jesus, here's the encouraging thing. It's enough for us. It's sufficient for us. It'll replenish us. And so God's grace replenishes our strength, but it does more than just that. Not only does it replenish our strength, it replenishes our spirit because going through trials can be very discouraging. And some Christians allow their spirits to become affected by it. When suffering hits, when problems come, when trials are there, when you're weary, when you're fearful, when you're, when you're burdened, when you've been in the spin cycle... If we're not careful, if we're not guarding our hearts, if we're not making sure our grace tanks are filled, our spirit can become downtrodden. We can become negative. You know, we could once have been excited, happy, exuberant, joyful Christians. But the trials of life, man, it can beat us down. And discouraged Christians allow their spirit to be scarred. Maybe there's been some other brother or sister in Christ who let you down, who did something that hurt you. Maybe there was some spiritual leader that you looked up to that disappointed you, that failed you, and you've allowed that to scar your spirit. That can hurt. That can discourage us. The greatest thing we can have in our homes and our churches is a spirit that's right with God. A spirit uh, that is not bitter. A spirit that's not cold. Ask yourself this morning, how's my spirit? Am I bitter? Am I cold? Are there things, are there people that I have allowed to affect my spirit? The only thing that, that can replenish that, it's God's grace again. Man, we see that over and over. Our wounded spirits can show to others. Trials are going to come into your life. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to let you down. Some spiritual leader is going to fail you. Uh, you can just mark it down. It's going to happen. Somebody is going to offend you. But God wants to replenish you through his grace to help you overcome those obstacles so you'll continue serving him. Because he won't let you down. He won't disappoint you. He won't fail you. If you're just going off of your feelings, what other people are doing, you'll find yourself, man, I just can't serve God anymore. But that's when we have our eyes on people. You remember Peter walking on the water. When did he get in trouble? Well, it was when he took his eyes off Jesus. And he began looking at all the circumstances around him, right? That's when he began to sink. And what was it that, that brought Peter back? He, he got his attention focused back on Jesus again. Lord, save me. And, and Jesus was right there to, to pick him up. So don't allow obstacles in your life from disappointments from other people to stop you from serving him. 
you know, His grace, it'll replenish our spirit from doubt to faith. Uh, The entire book of Philemon, just a few short verses. But Paul wrote this because there was a man by the name of Onesimus that was Philemon's slave. And he had run away to escape bondage and ended up in jail there in Rome. And he meets Paul and becomes a Christian. And Paul encourages Onesimus to return. But Philemon had lost faith in in Onesimus and no longer trusted him. And in Philemon verse number 18, Paul writing this to Philemon says... If he hath wronged thee, speaking of Onesimus, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Uh, It seemed there may have been some sort of monetary uh, thing involved in this. And Paul says, you know, I'll pay for whatever this man has done. Now, there's some good stuff that we could spend a whole morning talking about right there, you know, some some correlations between, you know, what Jesus has done for us. He he took our sins and said, put that on my account. Uh, You know, even though uh, we've disappointed uh, the Father... uh, He said, put it on my account. He went to the cross and paid for our sins. And Paul says, hey, Philemon, whatever this guy has done, whatever Onesimus has done, uh, put it on my account. I'll take care of it. And he says, "Uh, I've written it with mine own hand. I'll repay it, albeit I do not say thee uh, how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Uh, He writes this short letter to Philemon. He reminds him how the grace of God worked in his life. He reminds Philemon of where he was before he became a Christian after he talked with Paul. Man, Paul had the unique opportunity to share Christ with both of these men. And he says, just as God accepted you, you need to accept Onesimus back. And how is that kind of forgiveness, and we see other examples in Scripture where people forgive others, How is forgiveness like that possible when people disappoint us, when people fail us, when people wound our spirits? Well, it's not possible in our own strength. We've got to have some supernatural help from God to be able to forgive those who have wronged us. And we yield our stubborn will to God. Because we, it's not our human nature to forgive. We like to hold grudges. We like to remind people of the past. Now, we don't like it when people do that to us, but yet somehow we always turn around and do that to others. And we forget our great example in Jesus. And the book of Peter says, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And though the, the Bible doesn't finish the story in Philemon, that it, just that short letter is included. But church history tells us that, that Onesimus was indeed accepted when he returned back and eventually became the pastor of the church at Ephesus where Timothy pastored. Wow. God's grace at work in his life. It kept Philemon's spirit from reflecting the, the hurts that he had suffered. Because he accepted him back. And according to history, look how Onesimus turned out. And God's grace will do the same in your life. Think about the people who have wronged you. If you'll offer forgiveness to them, what could God do with a relationship like that? Uh, Imagine the the testimony that Philemon and, and Onesimus eventually had to share with others who were going through hurts and difficulties, how they were able to share how God intervened in their relationship, how that was restored, how Philemon was wounded by this, but, but God's grace restored him. And now look at the people that Onesimus is bringing to Christ because of it. Many people talk about grace, but they don't exhibit it in their spirits. We can be guilty of that. We talk about God's grace and then we turn around and become the the meanest Christian that anybody ever knew. That's kind of not reflecting what we talk about. It's a double standard, right? When people accuse Christians of being hypocrites, it's things like that 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 fuel those fires. We don't need to give people any opportunity to speak ill against our, our faith. 
And so we need to make sure that we're practicing, that we're living out what we're telling people, that, that God's full of grace and love and mercy. But is it reflected in your life? Are you showing that same sort of forgiveness to others? Think about uh, Thomas. Despite hearing the testimony of the other disciples, he refused to believe that Jesus was alive. Now, what are some reasons that that could have been? Do you think that it's possible that Thomas, that his spirit was hurt? Because, again, the disciples had this dream of what things were going to be like with Jesus as the Messiah. They were expecting a physical kingdom right then that Jesus was going to build up. He was going to free them from all this Roman oppression, that he was some sort of political savior. And then he dies. And so maybe Thomas just didn't want to believe again. He's hurt. And even though there's people standing in front of him, he just can't believe it. You know, it can be like that in our lives. We can allow hurt in our life to really keep us from believing and serving God if we allow it to. Now, eventually, Thomas, we know that he went from doubting back to faith. And so, praise the Lord, he didn't stay there. Sometimes we just kind of want to wallow in that, and we never get back up from it. But God says, my grace is there. I'll, I'll replenish you. I'll give you the ability to move from doubt back to faith. And then he says he wants to move us from discouragement to hope. Because when we forget that God's working on our behalf, even when we don't see it, when we can't see the hand of God moving in our lives, we think that if we can't see it at this very moment, that God must have forgotten us. And we become discouraged by that. But grace gives us hope and comfort in the hard times, and it keeps us from giving up. Even when you don't see God working... He's always there. He's always working. Things are moving in the background. That's why he gives us the example of people like Joseph, right? Could Joseph see the hand of God moving? Did Joseph understand everything that was going on? But we know that God was working all things for good. And eventually Joseph gets to the point, Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And Grace will move us from discouragement to hope. Paul said it establishes us. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul said, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. Grace is very practical. I like things that are practical, like how does this... Work for me right now. Well, look at what Paul says. He says that grace, uh, it's not just a feeling. He says grace is the very foundation of your good words and your good works. That's where it all begins, right there. Nothing shows God to the world. Nothing shows God to the people around you more than demonstrating grace in difficult circumstances. Because when you move from discouragement to hope, and you recognize that God's working, even when you can't see it, that begins showing a testimony to other people. They'll begin to ask that question, how are you able to go through these things? And now the door's wide open. When people see us living in hope instead of despair, they become interested in what we have. Now, if you go around living in despair all the time, woe is me, man, God's forgotten me. Why am I enduring all these bad things? You know, this just isn't right. This isn't fair to me. Well, people are going to look at you. They're going to kind of be confused. That's not what God wants in your life. Uh, that's the same testimony that Paul and Silas had. That's what moved the Philippian jailer, remember? He asked the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why did he ask that? Because they were demonstrating the grace of God in their life. When everything else was falling apart, they weren't. Why? The grace of God. And he looks at them and says, 
okay, this is different. I've not seen anybody act like this before. What have you guys got that I don't? And that's why Paul was able to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And what happens? He believes and then his house believes and they all get baptized and the whole family comes to know Christ because two men refuse to be discouraged. They're in chains. They're in bondage. What are they doing? They're singing praises to God. Wow. And then lastly, grace replenishes our supply. When kids grow up to be teenagers, this is a fun fact, okay? I know some of you don't know this. Uh, They eat more groceries. And the supplies don't stretch very far. You have to get more. And we have to continue replenishing the pantry. Well, it's the same way in our lives. We have to return to the throne of grace over and over and over again for our needs. Uh, In Matthew chapter 6, you know, the model prayer, what did Jesus say? Give us this day our daily bread. He didn't ask for it all at one time, did he? Why? Well, if God were to give us all the supply that we'd ever need right now, we wouldn't go back to him. If we got it all up front right now today, why do I need to go back tomorrow? But he gives us what we need today. We go back to him tomorrow. He gives us what we need tomorrow. And the day after, and the day after, it builds that relationship with him where we're we're depending on him to supply what we need for today. Number one, he supplies forgiveness by his grace. Uh, Because ultimately, our greatest need, it's not, you know, economical, it's not educational, it's not emotional. What's our greatest need in life? We need forgiveness. Forgiveness of our sin. And so God, His grace, provides that forgiveness. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Uh, We were given grace because God is good and loving, not because we deserved it. There's nothing in us that deserves grace. It was unmerited, undeserved favor from God, and he gives it to us. Religions around the world, they offer salvation through uh, works. You do some good works, you exchange it for for salvation. Uh, But there's no forgiveness apart from grace. It's said outside of New York City, there's a cemetery. There's a headstone there that just has a single word on it. No name, no anything. The only words on the headstone is the word forgiven. That's a pretty important thing, isn't it? That you leave this world forgiven. And then God supplies help by his grace. I like the song that says, sometimes God calms the storm, sometimes he calms me. Sometimes he'll let the storm rage around us, as we're always praying for God to do what? Take away all these circumstances. And sometimes God does that. But sometimes he chooses not to change the circumstances around us, but he'll calm us in the middle of the storm. And salvation, it meets our greatest need, but then after we're saved, we still need God's grace. We need help in time of need. That's why I like these words in Hebrews chapter 4. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is touched when you hurt. When you're in pain, when you're suffering, when when your spirit is scarred, Jesus hurts. He's touched. Why? Because he suffered adversity and temptation just like you do. He went through the same things that you've gone through. He understands the pain, and so he offers his grace freely. Someone once said, grace is the support beam for the soul after it has first received mercy. Man, I like that one. Many people don't finish well. They kind of give up. Their grace tanks run low. Things in life happen. 
They get too busy, they get too wounded, they get too hurt, and they just say, I can't serve God anymore. Failures like that are not failures on God's part. It's not a failure of God giving grace. What's the failure? It's a failure of us coming to God asking for grace. John R. Rice once said, uh, our greatest failures are prayer failures. When we get to the point where we're no longer praying to God, we're not seeking that daily bread, we're not asking him to give us what we need today, we're not asking for that strength, that grace to replenish, to renew, to restore, to fill up our grace tanks again. That's not his fault. It's ours. He's got an unlimited, unending resource of grace that will help you. We just have to take advantage of it. Trials are necessary for spiritual growth. God allows us to struggle so we can grow to develop uh, our spiritual muscles so we can be used for him, for his glory. The uh, hymn writer Isaac Watts, he wrote the, the hymn with these words in it, Must I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease? The Christian life's not always easy. We know the answer to that is no. But in every single trial, in every single trouble, in every single problem, adverse circumstance, sickness, and suffering, God provides sufficient grace if we go to him and ask for it. How many times, instead of going to God to ask for his grace, do we go to other people and begin to complain about our circumstances? When he's sitting there with the grace ready to pour it out, if only we'd ask him. Because you can't do anything for me this morning. It might make me feel better for a minute, you know, to vent to somebody. But you can't relieve all of the problems in my life. But there is one who can. God. He'll either calm the storm or he'll calm me. He's promised that he'll give us the help that we need if we'll simply go to the throne of grace. He'll pour it out. It'll replenish us and give us the strength to continue in the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that Scripture says every single believer is in. You're going to run low on grace. You have to make the choice if you'll go back to the throne to get filled up again. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity to study the Word of God this morning. I pray that it's been a help to us, that it's been uh, challenging to us, Lord, that, that it's been encouraging to us, that we would... Never forget that your grace is offered to us in an unending supply. Lord, that when things get tough and difficult, that, that rather than complaining to other people, that we would go pour our hearts and our burdens out to you and seek your all-sufficient grace. We pray that you'd bless us in this morning's service. We pray that you'd meet with us, Lord. We know that, that everything is done in vain this morning if you don't show up. And so, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be focused on you this morning, that we would uh, just offer our lives and worship to you today for all that you've done. We love you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.